background. Um, so we've just started recording um, and maybe we'll just begin in a moment. Um, you'll see I've got a couple of colleagues with me on the call. Uh, they're really here just to sort of manage the technical elements of the call. So um, Steve, who's on, is our uh, media expert, and he's going to just be doing the editing and things afterwards. So he's on to troubleshoot any problems. And Andrea is on as our events coordinator, and so she's just making sure that everything runs smoothly. Okay, excellent. But I think at this point they'll fade into the background unless there's any... Great. Yeah, you're both looking and sounding really good, so yeah, I'll just uh, fade away now. That be here okay. if anything comes up. Thank you so right. much. Mm -hmm. So, well, so if we need to retake any particular segment, we'll just rewind to the beginning of that. Question. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We've got experts here. Okay. Exactly. It's it's wonderful to meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Mm -hmm. my, my pleasure. It's um, uh, I, I know that it's, it would have been great if we could have coordinated speaking at a meeting, but it's very difficult with time zones. Mm -hmm. We have, I know, I know those pesky time zones. <laughs> we have members of our network who are sort of uh, uh, at each stage around the world. And so it's, it's always difficult to kind of find a time that works. We have, we have some colleagues from New Zealand that actually log in at um, two in the morning or three in the morning for the call, but it's, it's an awful lot to ask. Um, for, for, for various people. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought if it's okay, what I would do is just start with a little bit of background about what this is about and, and the network itself. And then maybe we could get into our dialogue and our conversation. Oh, I see uh, one of your colleagues. Francis, Hi, nice Francis. to meet you. Hi. Hello, we're, we're live or not really live, but recording. Yeah. Good morning. Hi, Good is the connection all right? It's mm -hmm. perfect. Okay. Yeah, everything is going very well. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I was I was just explaining that I'm going to start with just a little bit of background about the network itself and what this is about and why we've asked uh, the minister to speak, and then we'll get into the conversation if if that's okay um, for today. Perfect. Um, and it's it's just I have to say, you know, I spend a lot of my time talking to people in different countries around the world, and it's it's amazing to be able to look and see you sitting in an office uh, working. You know, some mm -hmm. of our conversations, Francis, are with people who are. You know, in the, well, as you can see, I'm in the basement um, uh, of the house or, you know, all over the place. And so it is, it is definitely, it's definitely great. Mm -hmm. So um, where, where I come from on this, um, my day job or where, where I started from was with the Canadian government. And I was responsible for, as part of our preparation for the federal elections in 2019, setting up something called the Digital Citizen Initiative. And what that was, is it was looking at ways to engage with civil society to use their expertise in talking to to Canadians and getting people prepared uh, to in sort of inoculate people against disinformation ahead of the federal mm -hmm. election. Um, and in doing so, one of the things as the government became more and more engaged in this and, and following the election was recognizing that um, while a lot of the work that's going on uh, has a domestic lens that we're looking at how we apply mm -hmm. domestic policy uh, instruments, uh, legislation, regulation, all of these things to look at the global infodemic. Um, the, the problems are really international. And if we're trying mm -hmm. to think about how to solve these problems, we actually really need to find ways to work together with people from other countries mm -hmm. and other places. Mm -hmm. They were Just not like the pandemic. Yeah. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, very, very similar. Um, and yet looking at this from a domestic perspective in government, I really struggled to identify who my counterparts were in other places. Um, it was one of those kinds of things where, um, you know, the minister's office would come to me and say, who should we speak to in Germany? And I would say, I don't even know who in Germany is responsible for the Netzdg law, let alone, you know, how to get in touch with them or make those connections. Mm -hmm. And so the Center for International Governance Innovation, where I'm working, and the Reset uh, Network, where I know, uh, Minister, you're, you're engaged. Yeah, I'm a uh, Network Investment Council member. That's right. So they, they approached me and they said, you know, would I think about taking on this role to bring together public servants uh, of all types? So, you know, uh, civil servants, legislative staff, regulators from around the world who are all dealing with these issues and find ways to, um, to sort of harmonize our efforts, essentially, and to work together. So we launched in the summer and we've held a series of meetings basically once every month talking about different issues. And we're trying to do something a little bit different um, First of all, we're not um, multi-stakeholder. So we are just government. The idea being then you actually talk to people who you can kind of share ideas with and learn from and have sort of face the same world. But also, and I think this is equally important, um, we're really trying to be 
global and not simply focus on existing relationships and traditional mm -hmm. relationships. And so to talk to and hear voices from and learn from uh, the global south, from partners outside of the transatlantic alliance, from all those kinds of places. Um, and then to deal with with the actual problems we're facing. So, for instance, we had an interesting session in the fall where we talked about how to talk to platforms. That is, mm -hmm. everyone is dealing with digital platforms, but how do we actually speak to them in a way that they'll understand us and we can understand mm -hmm. them? Um, so it's, you know, th those kinds of things and you'll see, I've got 1 question, uh, in my list. I sent you, uh, related to that. Uh, and so the session we're holding next week, this is what this interview is about. Um, 1 of 1 of our colleagues and a, a fellow at CG, uh, as well as a, a, a noted researcher in Canada, uh, Heidi to had led a, a, a team looking at. COVID-19 uh, responses, communications responses around the world, and looked at kind of what worked and what didn't, um, why certain things worked, and really tried to unpack and understand what we can learn from this experience that can then help guide our future work. And as part of this, um, she said to one of the countries, as you may know, that she looked at was Taiwan, and she and I were talking, and we were kind of talking about um, what's a practical, um, oh, yes, sorry, Francis, we are recording. Um, and we'll send you, so I should have started, I apologize. Um, we're going to send you the raw recording from this afterwards so that you have the entire raw recording. And then we're also going to uh, package this into the interview portion and then a sort of smaller segment. So we'll send you all three of those pieces. Um, anyway, perfect. Uh, so I can turn off my camera so it will only yes. leave. Yeah, okay, I'll turn, turn it off right now. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, to, just to continue, so the goal really is to say, what can we learn about this experience in part to learn about um, how other countries can emulate some of the efforts that Taiwan has made in countering the misinformation and disinformation around COVID-19. But I think equally importantly, it's to say, what are the lessons we can learn about this experience that can inform our future efforts on in sort of the broad realm of strategic communications, right? And so this would be, um, all of the different areas where we're trying to deal with just misinformation, but from a government response perspective, um, and as as you're, I'm sure, well aware, it's not a thing governments do for the most part incredibly well. Um, governments aren't amazing communicators, um, and so you know this is an area I think there's a lot of benefit from us about and learning from and listening uh, uh, mm -hmm. and gaining experiences. Um, did you have any questions before we start, or is there anything that wasn't clear about what we're up to? There's a technical question. So if I want to share something like this very cute Shiba Inu, uh, do, do you prefer if I just hold it like this or do you prefer if I use the WebEx sharing function? Oh, that's a good question. Steve, may I turn to you? Uh, that's a good question. Why don't you, um, you can hold it up, mm -hmm. I think, and then if, can you, like if you no, I can send you the slide afterwards. Uh, if, sorry, yeah, so you can send me afterwards and I can cover over it when I edit. Yeah, okay, so so just making sure the, the brightness and everything uh, works well. You can see the ring light, I guess. Uh, okay, but, but this frame should be working-ish. Yep. Okay, we're good. That, so, so I'll just- looks good, no glare or anything like that. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll just do that and, and stay at the, I think that would be bottom right corner for you. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions or thoughts before we start? Uh, I think we can start uh, and uh, yes, just a reminder, um, just, just so we can make sure that there is no overlapping uh, picture and video. If uh, Minister, if you can maybe just uh, wait a moment after Chris asks his question before you respond, just so we don't okay. see him and hear you. And, and I can even mute while Chris speaks. It, would that help you? That, that would help, but I don't want to like disrupt the flow because they're having like some back and forth. But um, ah, okay. We're, probably, okay. We're, we're more concerned about uh, we might need to mute Chris if we hear any sound from his end. <laughs> okay. Well. Okay. So so I'll wait a couple of seconds before responding. That's fine. That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. And yes, I, I was I was joking with the team ahead of the meeting that. Um, I do get enthusiastic about some of this material, and so I, I really do have to restrain myself. So being muted and needing to unmute is probably not a terrible thing for me to make sure there is that break between us speaking. Okay, okay. Perfect. <laughs> All right, let's get so started. So I'm going to launch into the first question. Thank you. Um, so we're now more than a year since the start of the pandemic. Uh, and as we know, and as we've experienced, um, 
a lot of countries have recently gone back into lockdown or really uh, in Canada uh, for a lot of businesses, we've really never left lockdown. We're looking at almost a year in lockdown. Um, you know, we've had some good news from the WHO. It looks like transmission rates are on a downward trend. But, you know, globally, the picture still looks very bleak. Uh, death tolls and, and transmission rates are still enormously high, really, except in Taiwan. And I'm, I'm really interested to hear your perspective as you look back over the past year. Uh, what the key factors were that enabled you in Taiwan to manage the spread of the virus so well. Um, and, and in addition to that, maybe as you're thinking about that, not simply initially, which I think some countries sort of managed the first wave well, but in fact that you've kept that going, you've kept that momentum over the course of the year. I think the most important reason uh, is that in Taiwan, we've all had a collective societal inoculation. Uh, people above 30 years old remember how bad SARS was in 2003 in Taiwan. And right after SARS, while the memory was still fresh in the society, we institutionalized those memories into the um, Central Epidemic Command Center, the design of the Communicable Diseases Act, all the institutions that make sure that whenever SARS 2.0, which is how we refer to COVID-19 uh, this time uh, hits, uh, we will be able to play the SARS playbook without, for example, declaring a state of emergency, without, for example, lockdowns, because we understand how um, bad it could be uh, in SARS 1.0. So people collectively would be willing to do more, like wearing masks and washing hands and so on, uh, without the state having to do everything in a top-down fashion, which, frankly speaking, does not last a very long time without people understanding the why of it. And the the um, result of SDECC, Central Epidemic Command Center, is that uh, anything that's related to the epidemiology, whenever something gets discovered by the scientists, like the asymptomatic transfer and things like that, it gets broadcasted to all corners of society very quickly, very easily, um, with this very helpful spokesdoc the Zongchai, a very cute Shiba Inu, um, explaining not only the science behind it, uh, the practical tips, like if you're uh, outdoor, you're supposed to keep two Shiba Inus away from one another uh, or wear a mask, that's called physical distancing. Uh, or if you're uh, indoors, then that's three um, Shiba Inus away <laughs> and so on. Uh, and so these messages uh, go viral uh, in the sense that people would uh, voluntarily share it because it's very uh, fun uh, to begin with. So uh, by making sure that there's a positive mindset, a positive engagement. Um, we can even make jokes uh, about, for example, um, this is a classic, this is the Shiba Inu telling you wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hands. Um, and this is uh, hilarious because the, the Shiba Inu is really very cute in putting their uh, feet to their mouth. Uh, and so people remember that and share that And then, because this message ultimately appealed to rational self-interest instead of saying uh, protect the elderly, respect others, respect the medical workers, which are all fine, but these messages don't tend to go viral, whereas protecting yourself from your own and watch them tend to. Sorry, I'm just unmuting. Thank you very much. Uh, that's, and you know, it's interesting. I really like that element of humor um, brought into it. I, I'm curious though, and I, if you don't mind pushing just a little bit on it. Sure, um, of course. I mean, I do, I do recognize, you know, how much you learned from the SARS experience, but what I found interesting is that in a lot of, I mean, there were other countries that have also faced sort of those kinds of outbreaks and it doesn't feel like their reactions were the same. You know, it sort of, it feels like there's something um, that, that Taiwan has done, and, and I think the uh, bringing in that humor element is 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 super important. Um, and I, I also really took that you know that something I've read that you've talked about is that instant transmission, right? That 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 something comes and you respond immediately. That is, it doesn't need to go through layers of bureaucracy or layers of thinking before before it comes out. And I guess really that comes down to an element of trust, right? The trust that you have with the citizens, and then the trust that they have with government. And when you build that mutual trust. Um, you know, it kind of can enable you to kind of carry that forward. I, I'm really curious around this question of trust and, and how you feel that Taiwan has created or, or sort of set the stage for that level of trust in government. Um, you know, we, what we've seen in our network is talking to a number of different countries. Trust is, is sort of an ephemeral thing, and it can be very difficult for governments to rebuild one once it's lost. And it feels like in a short order, Taiwan has really kind of turned around its relationship with people. I don't know if you had any comments or thoughts about that. Yeah, I tend to think uh, of trust in terms of trustworthiness. Uh, and one part of trustworthiness is, is reciprocal. So before the citizen could trust the government, the government must first trust the citizens. 
And if the government trusts its citizens, it means that, for example, we're willing to publish uh, the real-time mask availability as open API, that's real-time open data, instead of having to uh, review uh, the statistics and publish every quarter or, or every week. Um, we publish every 30 seconds. The each pharmacies, like 6,000 pharmacies, the uh, people queuing in line, swiping their national health card, can see that the real-time availability on their phone um, actually goes down by two at a time uh, a year ago. Uh, nowadays, it's by 10 uh, every time. Um, and then people queuing in line, if they detect any anomaly, they can just call the toll-free number 1922 and very quickly point out the problem uh, with the system. And so because of that, this uh, participatory accountability, anyone who think that the government is not trustworthy in some regard, immediately become a co-creator by calling 1922 and pointing out something that we did wrong. And instead of defending existing policy, um, our minister Chen Shizhong, the commander of the CECC, usually just says, um, teach us. <laughs> so it's an invitation to co-creation. When a young boy uh, called last April uh, to 1922 saying, you're reaching out on mask. All my classmates <clears throat> have this navy blue medical grade mask, but all I get is pink ones. Uh, I don't want to wear pink to school, I'm a boy. Um, then on the very next day in the daily 2 p.m. Uh, live stream press conference, all the medical officers, regardless of gender, wore pink medical masks. And the commander even said that Pink Panther uh, was his uh, childhood idol or something. So the boy became the most hit boy in the class for he um, is the only one in the class that has the color that the heroes and the heroes heroes wear. And so this kind of immediate response um, is not about a blind trust to the government authority, but about the government trusting its citizens and amplifying the social innovations, the co-creations and so on in a very rapid uh, iteration cycle. And I would argue that builds trustworthiness over time. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, that's brilliant. And, you know, it's, 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 it's a really striking feature of uh, when, when reading about what you've done is, is this sort of the co-creation element. And I really like that. It sort of, it turns around that criticism on its head, right? Because criticism is no longer a negative. Criticism just becomes a positive in terms of contributing to and helping society move it forward. Do you feel, and, and I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about, for just for people who aren't aware, the, the V Taiwan, that sort of platform that you've built, because, you know, it, it feels in a way that, um, in addition to your preparation because of SARS, the preparations you'd done with with sort of the the hacker community or kind of being prepared for the civic engagement also contributed equally to to your ability to respond to the to the virus. Certainly. So um, V Taiwan is a project <clears throat> done by the Gov Zero or G Zero V uh, civic hacker community. And um, let, let me do this again. Certainly. So V Taiwan is a project of the G0V or Gov0 community in Taiwan, which is a civic technologist community that contributes into participatory democracy online. And the idea of V Taiwan is that instead of having just a handful of representatives talking about em uh, emergent phenomena like um, Uber uh, or about um, crowdfunding or about teleworking or things like that, um, these emergent phenomena uh, stakeholders can actually re present themselves rather than having someone represent them. Uh, and using AI that's assistive intelligence, we can make sure that people's uh, common feelings, common values uh, are given the air uh, of the agenda setting power instead of just the polarized, um, divisive, zero-sum, uh, toxic uh, behaviors that sometimes we see on private infrastructure, so-called social, but actually anti-social media. Um, and so this uh, pro-social media, if you will, uh, for deliberative democracy is really helpful in framing the conversation around, for example, sharing economy uh, in 2015, instead of uh, debating endlessly about whether uh, not carpooling um, is sharing economy, uh, but time sharing is sharing economy, what really is sharing economy? Should they be called platform or gig economy instead? Uh, and, and that leads us practically nowhere, right? Uh, we instead of uh, talk about what is considered the norm uh, when people drive around random strangers and charging them for it. And people understand that, hey, we can uh, agree that insurance, registration, uh, making sure that the road is fairly used, that people do not undercut each other in um, like um, 
unfair competition and things like that. These are things that people commonly care about regardless of whether they're a taxi driver or a Uber driver. So nowadays, uh, Uber is a Taiwanese taxi company, actually, the Q-Taxi, but we also revamped the taxi law so that those so-called multi-purpose taxis can use a software meter uh, and uh, they don't have to paint their car yellow and things like that. So everyone wins and we have many uh, co-ops and companies entering this multi-purpose taxi. And so this very small vignette tells us that for each emerging phenomena, we can use AI and online conversation in a way that's actually pro-democracy as long as we see democracy as a type of technology that we're willing to change and hack ourselves. Thank you so much. Um, you know, and and I, I mean, I have to say, I find that both the example uh, and and your your retelling of it uh, really inspiring. Um, you know, I, it, it's funny. Um, it, it's one of those areas we, we had we had a similar set of conversations here in Canada around Uber and and taxis, but it, somehow in these conversations we we never we didn't create that space for people to actually be able to share their feelings and, and to sort of understand every side. And, and I think that that open space just feels like exactly what what the, the technology should be used for, right? It's it sort of, um, in effect, it, it was a really interesting thing, you know, sort of reading about your work and, and sort of following what, what, what's been happening in Taiwan. Um, a lot of the time in, in the work that I've been been undertaking, both in the Canadian government and now with the Global Platform Governance Network, when governments and civil society get together, and when we talk about the role of big tech in society, we talk about the role the technology plays. Um, there's a tendency for the conversation or for the discussion to end up focusing primarily on the challenges brought about by big tech. I mean, I think there is still this kind of, you know, we recognize the positives. I mean, the very fact that we can have this conversation and we can include people from around the world is an incredible benefit to to you know to us as we try and solve problems communally and together. But it it really struck me um and hearing you speak now how positive you are about the role of society and and how, how positive the role that tech can play in society's challenges uh, i'm i'm interested to hear your thoughts because i mean i think this is something it, it almost harkens back in a way to the kind of where we thought the internet was going to be um you know in this kind of way that we'd be problem solving in a community uh community actions and community activities um how do you think other governments can kind of recapture that spirit of tech, tech optimism that what we've lost? And really, what's the key uh, fr from your point of view? I think the key is to think of them as digital public infrastructure. Uh, much as we have town halls and parks uh, and public libraries and other public infrastructures uh, where the civil society can gather and public deliberations taking place, um, as long as we have sufficient amount of these uh, investments into public infrastructure, for example, the V Taiwan conversation took place on Polis, uh, which is free software. Uh, and as you can see, um, it doesn't even have a reply button. You can agree and disagree uh, on my idea about uh, passenger liability insurance are very important, uh, but you can't really attack me or troll me. Uh, and if you agree, you move uh, closer toward me. If you disagree, you move farther away from me. And after three or four weeks of conversation, and this is maybe the most important picture um, that police can show you, is that the divisive um, ideological uh, things are like exactly maybe five. And there's uh, far more consensus statements, the people's feelings that are shared, regardless of their ideological positions. And there's um, a surprisingly large amount of coherence uh, in people's common feelings that are just not amplified when you're deliberating on a private infrastructure optimized for addiction uh, and optimized for short-term attention span and selling of advertisements. Uh, so um, this is akin to holding a public deliberation, not on a public park, but rather on a nightlife district, a bar with bouncers and selling addictive drinks. And I don't think the deliberative quality will be very good, right? So uh, I think the whole idea of public infrastructure, which we um, grasp intuitively when it's a physical infrastructure, we need to lift it to the digital infrastructure and do what I call the people-public-private partnerships in which the people, that's the social sector, sets the agenda 
co-governs the infrastructure, the public sector, the career public service endorse the use, the binding power only to those infrastructure that are publicly co-governed using free software and open governance. And finally, the economic sector participates in helping to scale this out, to scale this up, but always under the norms that are already set by the people and the public sectors. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I think you hit on, on such a key feature of this uh, in, in the, the last your last statement. And, and I, I really I love that that kind of conception of people, public, uh, private partnership, you know, sort of putting the, the people first. Uh, and that's really not, you know, where, where I've seen conversations around uh, the digital infrastructure that it should be public infrastructure. Very often it ends up being with sort of government saying, well, we should build another internet or we should build another website uh, and then force people to use it. And, and, and sort of it feels like th that's really a non starter. That's not going to achieve what we want to achieve. But as you say, having something designed by people then used based on free infrastructure really seems to be quite exciting. And I also really liked, um, I don't know if you had more to add, um, but I really liked how we avoid the trolling. Because I think, you know, that, that's become, and, and I think you're right that. You know, so much of that is based around we're we're using for profit infrastructure that's more akin to like a nightclub than a, than a public park um, that that is in fact driving divisiveness rather than driving consensus. Um, but I, I mean, I think that's a really quite exciting uh, uh, way to turn it around. You know, it, it ties in actually something we talked about in a, one of our conversations in the fall in the network. Um, we were talking with um, a, a few of our colleagues um, in government and in research about. How do we, as I said, how do we talk to platforms differently? How do we engage differently? And where do the challenges lie? And one of the things that one of our colleagues, Rebecca Trumbull from uh, George Washington University um, recommended, she said, you need to have more data scientists in government. So you need to have more people who understand how this works and you need fewer sort of uh, people who can be sort of hoodwinked by the digital platforms and sort of taken into their, their way of looking at the world and instead have people who can actually explain, this is how things work. And then they need to talk to the data scientists and the, the engineers within the platforms. And, you know, that's how you're going to find a different set of uh, solutions. But when I listen to your, uh, this idea of a people, public, private partnership, it, it, and, and for some of the things of, of yours that I've read, it almost feels like, I, I wonder if you would say that we should almost flip that around that rather than having the data scientists in government, what we actually need to do is um, open up more government to data scientists. I mean, more, you know, sort of let's not, let's not try and recreate their part of things, but actually let's have the 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 community experts or the community engage and do their part and then government do its part to amplify or, or support or populate with data totally uh in taiwan uh the open api directive says that whenever we collect any data that is not of course pertaining to uh national security or privacy issues anything that is clear of these issues we need to publish it as soon as it's collected this is actually quite radical because uh, around the world, under the Freedom of Information uh, Acts, it's usually first by request and also always reviewed first by the career public servants before anything goes from the state uh, to the people. But by saying that this is open API, there's no way that a public servant can uh, review and approve the publication of the medical mask availability data every 30 seconds. They wouldn't be able to do anything else then, right? So we need to instead build a data pipeline uh, that is very good on the cybersecurity front, that is very good on the privacy preserving front and so on, and just keep the data pipeline running and once you have that data pipeline then you get for example in taiwan we have a, a legislator uh, before joining the parliament she was the um, vp of data analytics at foxconn so she knows something about data science um, mp gao hong an and she analyzed along with the open street map community the map uh, of the mask availability and concluded that even though it looks fair on the kind of satellite GPS map, it's actually unfair if you take into account the time you spend on public transportation in rural places. So um, if people take like four hours to go to a pharmacy and the pharmacy closed, even though it looks on the map that it's actually very close, it's not actually very close. So the government distribution uh, algorithm is actually biased while it actually looks fair uh, initially. And when she brought it up in a parliamentary interpolation because it's evidence-based, um, the minister simply said, legislator teach us. 
right? The minister doesn't have to defend any policy because it's obviously something a uh, very good insight. And the very next day, we started pre-ordering into 24-hour convenience stores. We redistributed uh, our supply and demand uh, algorithm in conjunction with the OpenStreetMap community and things like that. And so, yeah, exactly as you said, then a data scientist as a legislator or as a social sector participant um, has as much as agenda setting power as Minister Chen Shizhong. And the uh, MP simply said the very next day that yesterday's interpolation become tomorrow's co-creation. Wow. Um, you know, in, in, in uh, um, previous work, I, I've worked a little on the open government's uh, issues and, and was involved with some of the open government work here in Canada and in other places. And um, I mean, that's, that just sounds like a dream for, for some of my colleagues uh, to, to, to sort of hear that. And it's, it's really interesting because, I mean, I think you're absolutely right that the freedom of information by request is the norm. But even more um, from having sat on that side of the desk in government, the tendency is to try and l release as little as possible or else to flood with so much information as to make it unusable rather than to kind of think just as you said is how do we actually solve problems together and then how do we give the 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 particular the information that's that's going to be needed uh, and i think that that solution of having it be um, open api is is exactly the the, the way to go forward uh, you know and it, it does open up a question for me so one of the things we wanted to talk about is to think about how do we take the lessons that you've learned through this experience and through the other experiences you've had uh, and, and then apply them in the, in the question of sort of that uh, both foreign state uh, interference and, and disinformation and sort of for some of our other network members, disinformation campaigns by uh, um, extremists or, or others and kind of learn from these examples. Um, and, you know, one of the conversations that happens a lot, and I'm sure you've been privy to this, these kinds of sessions is, is that there are some people who argue that the antidote to disinformation is more and, and better information. Um, but it doesn't sound like that's, that's, uh, that's all that you've got in Taiwan. Like, I mean, that, that kind of the rapid response, the humor, you've got some other sort of pieces in there. I'm curious, what would you say are the key building blocks that governments need to put in place to sort of help build that societal resilience? Just as you talked about the community inoculation. Uh, against the fake, manipulated, uh, misleading information. Um, is there anything more you, you you can add on that? Certainly. In Taiwan, we make a distinction uh, between disinformation, which is intentional, and misinformation, which may not be. Uh, and against disinformation, it's not just humor over rumor, because there is, uh, it's almost like in a cybersecurity sense, there's a red team uh, operating. And uh, one case in point, is that in the mayoral election uh, and referenda of 2018, we've seen a lot of uh, money poured in uh, to say Facebook and other social media platforms uh, to do hyper-targeted, precision-targeted messaging uh, that are not in fact wrong, <clears throat> but actually more like malinformation <clears throat> in that it incites a certain, um, let me do this again. Certainly. So um, one part is a clear distinction between disinformation, which is intentional, and misinformation, which may not be. While misinformation can be countered quite successfully using cute spokesdogs and humor over rumor and things like that, this information, when it's intentional and backed by a lot of money, uh, sometimes by foreign states, uh, that's not as easy to counter using humor. Uh, one case in point is that in the 2018 local election, we actually saw a lot of money poured into, say, Facebook and other social media with precision targeted advertisements that are opaque uh, and that could not be attributed back uh, to who gave the money. Compare that with the campaign donation and expense, which must be filed to the National Auditing Office and is always restricted to domestic donors only. So it's almost like uh, through those uh, social media platforms, they found a way to bypass the uh, democratic oversight of campaign donation and expenditure. Now, interestingly, the solution did not originally came from the government. It came from, again, the GovZero community. There's a project um, that uh, ask the volunteer to go to the National Auditing Office because at the time they were or, uh, already publishing the expenditure and donation information, but only in, on paper. So uh, they took out the paper, scanned the paper, uh, did this uh, OCR in computer vision, but the OCR is called Otaku Character Vision uh, Recognition because uh, people see like a CAPTCHA each uh, single cell of these large spreadsheets and uh, compete with each other and quickly uh, 
turning these into digital versions. Uh, and so this almost like civil disobedience of the past elections uh, really uh, put a lot of pressure on the National Auditing Office because the uh, office may say, uh, hey, you are not absolutely sure that these crowd OCR version is the correct one. And the civil society can simply say, so that's why you should publish as open data, right? Uh, and so uh, finally, the legislature saw the light and uh, asked the National Auditing Office to publish as open data so investigative journalists can do the analysis, which they did for the first time in 2018. And uh, lo and behold, people see that almost nobody filed those social media advertisements as campaign donation or expenditure. So it's clearly a bypass. So we turn around and talk to Facebook and friends saying, look, this is the social norm. This is not like we're passing a law or something uh, against you, but people have already put a lot of pressure on the National Auditing Office, and now they're turning this attention to you. So it's like a trade negotiation, right? We can talk to Facebook saying, <clears throat> so this is not a state um, request. This is rather a analysis of the societal um, temperature. And if they do not publish at least to the same kind of open data in real time, their advertisement library when it pertains to political and social issues uh, for uh, independent analysis and calling out dark patterns uh, on the next election, they may force social sanction. And this force of social sanction is not initiated by the state, but rather by the people, right? And, and that's why Facebook in 2019 uh, made Taiwan, I think, the first jurisdiction where they published the entire advertisement library under open data, actually as an open API, so that by our presidential election, uh, there's no such dark patterns that happen on Facebook and so on. So that's a successful negotiation. That's incredible. Um... Yeah, and I mean, as you say, it's a very different experience than I think other countries have had in dealing with the social media companies. But it sounds like as part of it, just as you've said, it's when it's driven from the community and it's driven from that that community-based conversation, it's less about governments coming in and saying, we're going to restrict what you do, we're going to drive you towards a certain end. It's more just let's engage and let's come up with a common set of solutions. Um, you know, it was, it, was, it was difficult coming into this and, and sort of looking at areas where uh, things had not gone well. Um, you know, it, it just, it, it really feels like, um, looking at not just the, the pandemic, but a lot of these other challenges, the Uber example, others, um, that, you know, things are going on a really good track, um, in, in Taiwan in these areas. But, you know, as, as we're looking at our, at our governments, as we're thinking about these things, one of the things that, that I think we sort of realize is governments, they tend to be afraid to take risks. There's a huge uh, uh, avoidance factor that comes in, and so there can be a real fear about trying new things. Um, one of the challenges that that I, I've experienced in in this space is, at the same time as we're afraid to do new things, we learn the most when things don't go well. I mean, it's it's those failures that actually teach us, right? That's that's kind of those experiences, and so. Well, justifiably, there's been a ton of talk about your success in the public response to COVID, and of course in these other areas as well. Are there other areas where you think? Um, some of your experiments didn't work and, and how do, how, I mean, I have a little bit of a sense in that kind of the way that when somebody comes into the criticism, it just sort of builds it into the solution is that it's a constant iterative development. And so there are no failures in that kind of sense. Like you're sort of constantly failing. Is that, is that. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so I'll go back to the mask rationing map example, because internationally it's been reported as a huge success, but it's actually a huge failure on the first day of launch. Uh, on February uh, 6th uh, in 2020, when the mask availability map was first uh, produced uh, in the pharmacy version, that is, um, a lot of pharmacists concurrently invented something new, uh, the take a number system. So this social innovation is basically, instead of handing out the medical mask in return of swiping their uh, national health card for the customers. They instead took the, the health care cards from the customers uh, and asking them uh, to go back uh, and um, they process the IC card in the pharmacy during the lunch break and ask the customer to return on, um, for example, uh, 7 8 p.m. or something and collect the mask and their IC card in exchange to the numbered uh, card that they gave us, right? So all these uh, pharmacists' social innovations actually are at odds uh, with the mask availability map because if you analyze it, like if you're a uh, ex Foxconn uh, data <laughs> analytic uh, person, uh, you will see that the, this particular pharmacy didn't sell anything until noon and uh, in the noon uh, like in a very short time span like 10 minutes 
they sell everything <laughs> on their stock. And and this kind of uh, real time API is actually misleading, not useful at all. And one of my nearby pharmacies even uh, go to the length of putting very large banners, posters on their front door on the glass window saying, don't trust the app, exclamation mark. Uh, and so <laughs> that, of course, is spectacular failure. But um, the way that the CECs recover from these failures is simply saying, um, so we didn't anticipate it, we apologize, and we're running a weekly iteration. We're using agile development. So by the next uh, sprints delivery, that's next Thursday, it's always next Thursday, uh, anyone who come up with ways to fix it, we will implement that fix. And so a pharmacist uh, said, okay, why don't you publish your open API two different time slots instead of one, one for collecting the cards and one for collecting the mask. Why, why not, right? So the pharmacy that used this take number system can just register like 7 to 9 a.m. and 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, in two time slots. So we did that the very next week. But the nearby pharmacy still didn't take that poster down. And so uh, I took a deep breath. I walk in and I ask, oh, so, so why? And they're like, um, actually, their cards run out uh, by, for example, 8 a.m. So there's still one whole hour. Uh, where they're on the map, but the number were inaccurate. And so I'm like, okay, so if you are the digital minister, what would you do? That's the favorite question I would ask people. Uh, and they consulted their pharmacy uh, group. Uh, and the very next day told me that if they use the backend system to input that they have sold uh, um, a lot of masks, more than their stock, then they get into negative availability and that made them disappear from the map. So it's a hack, almost like a white hat hacker thing because we didn't uh, check for the signs <laughs> in the uh, integer field, uh, but that's a workaround and that enabled them to took down the, the banners. So I went back, talked to the National Health Insurance Agency about this innovation uh, and they uh, formalized it and invented a button that any pharmacy can just push it and disappear from the map like a cloaking device. So that's um, after more than three weeks, more than three sp sprints. Uh, and so I think the most important thing here is that each failure can be turned into an opportunity to co-creation. But if we say we'll fix it, but actually fix it only like one month or two later, then people don't have that kind of patience. It really has to have a really short iteration cycle, like one week or at most two weeks for this kind of co-creation to work. Wow, that's that's amazing. And, and you know, it, it's, it really makes me think... Um, Earlier this year, we had a, a conversation about how to maintain horizontal efforts, given sort of, you know, traditional vertical accountability structures in government, right? Is that, you know, so often in a government structure, you have a, a an analyst reporting to a manager, reporting to a director, it sort of it goes up to a minister and then down, and, and, and it can be very difficult to kind of work cross purposes. And yet what, we're, what you're talking about or what you're describing is is the perfect example of of how working across those areas of, of of bringing in the public, of thinking all the, the sort of different roles, and each time there's a mistake, kind of, or a problem, or or, or a challenge, mm -hmm. learning, learning, and fixing it. And if you don't mind me asking, as as the minister, uh, um, you sort of coming at this in in this sort of on this cross cutting uh, perspective, do you find there's a challenge? I, I mean, how or how does how does one get past that challenge of this sort of Vertical accountabilities and and the the responsibilities of, of you know sort of people saying but I have to report to this person I have to work on this issue. Definitely, uh, I think the diversity uh, and a inclusive culture is the most important. Uh, my team, the public digital innovation space is around 20 people, uh, more than half of them career public service. Uh, and we very intentionally only allow one secondment. Uh, from each ministry. So the more than 12 ministries that have sent to come into my office understand that they cannot send two people at the same time. They have to rotate. And the reason is that we want a fresh perspective. Every time a new person come to our team, everybody can learn from them because they are the only one with that particular perspective. And once you have such a cross-cutting, maximally horizontal, diverse team, then people are willing to share what they have learned uh, with the community, uh, with like working out loud as a center um, ethos, because there's no um, like subordinates 
uh, in any particular sense because everyone is belonging to every different ministry, right? Uh, so no matter what their ranks are, people work as peers uh, in my team. But they, of course, still report to their own minister. They still take whatever they learned from the peers back to their ministry. And they themselves go back to the ministry after a year or two, right? Uh, and then someone else rotates in. And the trick here is that uh, by working out loud, this culture, even after they go back to their ministry, is still permeating uh, almost by osmosis uh, to their ministry about how horizontal structures, instead of um, fighting vertical structures, actually reinforces uh, like a bridge that connects those vertical pillars uh, reinforces uh, the idea of resilience. Whenever any particular pillar makes a mistake, that may actually offer a very good learning opportunity for the other pillars uh, in the same office. That's the same idea of biodiversity, by the way. Uh, and so because of that, uh, we have collaborative like culture that's willing to take risk because what's risky for one PDS member is actually not risky for other PDS members. And that sort of HR policy, I think is also very important. Thank you so much. Uh, that's a brilliant answer. And in, in fact, it's, it's exciting to see how you're hacking government essentially by, you know, rather than trying to deal with how do you deal with their vertical structures and your horizontal structure, it's more like encouraging them to see the benefit of horizontal by passing out the seeds of your of, of your efforts into the back into the into the sort of uh, um, uh, that larger the larger um, uh, biosphere of, of the government mm -hmm. of the government work um this has been so wonderful of you and I really appreciate all of your time um, did you have any final thoughts or questions you want to share with, with us uh, as, as we wrap up there's certainly no need to I just I if there's anything else on your on your mind that you wanted to share, I'd love to, love to hear from it. Yeah, certainly, uh, since uh, the theme uh, today seems to be turning mistakes into co-creation uh, opportunities, uh, I'll just uh, conclude by quoting my favorite uh, poet, uh, singer-songwriter, Canadian, uh, Leonard Cohen, uh, and in the verse uh, anthem uh, that said, ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. So live long and prosper. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful to meet you. Have yes. a fantastic day. Yeah, really, really good interview. Uh, and I look forward to receiving the recording. So thank you. We'll okay, see you soon. You. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.